when it comes to adding muscle mass, especially if you're looking to do it fast, you need to implement compound exercises into your routine consistently. When you're aiming for gains in size and strength, there are some key exercises you men and women need to be doing. What's going on folks, it's Midas here. And in this video, I'll be going over three major exercises you need to start doing if you want to add serious strength and size, or in other words, get bigger. Before I tell you guys what they are, let's start at the beginning. What's a compound exercise? Well, a compound exercise is any movement where you're using more than one muscle group at a time. These type of exercises activate a lot of muscles all at once, which usually leads to a lot of gains in strength and size. Some of you already know this, but not everyone does, and so a lot of people tend to skip out on these kinds of exercises due to how complex they look. Let's consider a squat, for example. This is a compound exercise that engages your core, quads, hamstrings, glutes, calves, lower back, and hip flexors. Using this to train your legs often will lead to an increase in the strength and size of your entire lower body. In contrast to compounds, isolation exercises tend to work one specific muscle group at a time. The bicep curl, for example, only aims to build muscle in your biceps. Opposite to isolation movements, compound exercises recruit multiple muscle groups and contribute towards more functional movements, meaning you perform day-to-day -day tasks better when you incorporate compounds into your training regimen. There's lots of compound exercises for you to pick from and to keep your muscles from getting completely adapted to a select few. The three I'll be talking about in today's video should never be the only compounds you do, but they should play a huge role. At the beginning of my fitness journey, I would go for isolation exercises only using machines and dumbbells. I rarely attempted compound exercises due to the perceived complexity of these exercises, and it's not totally wrong. One has to be very careful when working with heavy weights since there's a higher chance of injuries when working with them as opposed to lighter weights or no equipment at all. As a beginner or someone who has never tried compounds, when you see other folks doing compounds like presses, rack pulls, and the likes, it tends to look scary since most of the time, people doing these are lifting a lot of weight. There's really no need to be worried as the same people have built their strength up over time to be able to push or pull the weight load you're seeing. As a beginner to training with compounds and heavyweights, you should aim to perfect your form first and foremost before trying to advance through the ranks to push in massive weight loads. Bad form with compounds or any other exercise for that matter tend to lead to injuries and ineffective workout sessions. Once you've got the form for your compound movements perfected, then it's time to introduce progressive overload, which is a system that will allow you to maximize your compounds, leading to a stronger and larger physique. You already know by now that compound exercises promote growth in strength and size. They're arguably the best way to add muscle mass to the entire body in a short amount of time. If you didn't already know, progressive overload is when you gradually increase the weight, frequency, or the number of repetitions in your strength training or other kinds of routine. This challenges your body and allows your musculoskeletal system to get stronger. When this system is used with compounds for building strength and getting bigger, you want to gradually increase the weight load as you get stronger and current weight loads begin to get easier to lift. If you don't keep progressively increasing weight loads, you will eventually plateau and that means no more increase in strength and size. In my experience, progressive overload has been the best way to bulk and build mass. When bulking is your fitness goal, training with a lot of compound exercises is a must. You also need to eat a lot of high protein meals as well as high calorie foods in order to maximize your compound training. If you don't eat enough, you won't grow and your training will eventually stall. I'm going to go over arguably the top three compound exercises that you need to be doing to get bigger. I've used these compounds consistently over a long period of time and whenever I use them with a progressive overload style of training, the results and strength and size gains is always unmatched. No other training style I've used has helped me put on strength and size as quickly and effectively as progressive overload with compound exercises have. If you're a hard gainer and put on weight slow, you absolutely need to be doing this kind of training and eating big if you want to add size. If you gain weight slowly, you want to eat a little less as you combine this kind of training with some high intensity or cardiovascular routines for the best results in strength, size, and muscle aesthetics. You can perform these three compounds mainly with a barbell 
and or dumbbells. I'll suggest using a barbell, weight plates, and a rack for the best possible results since you can load as much weight as possible with a setup like that and they're designed for the main purpose of strength training with compound exercises. With dumbbells, unless you have a range of heavy weights to stimulate serious muscle growth, then it'll be difficult to chase size and strength goals. Your body will eventually get used to the maximum dumbbell weight load you have leading to a plateau like we talked about earlier, and we don't want that if we're looking to get bigger. Chances are high that you've probably heard about or seen people performing these three compounds we're about to talk about, but here we go. At number one, we have the bench press or chest press. This is the ultimate builder for the pec, shoulder, and tricep muscles. If you want bigger pecs and a bigger upper body in general, you need to implement this into your chest or push day training routines. The bench press is an upper body weight training exercise in which an individual presses a weight upwards while lying on a weight training bench. The exercise uses the pectoralis major or chest in general, the anterior deltoids or front shoulders, and the triceps, among other stabilizing muscles. A barbell is generally used to hold the weight plates up for this exercise. The movement can also be performed with dumbbells as well, but there's the issue of hitting a plateau quickly, unless you have access to a wide range of dumbbells that go as high as 150 pounds or even more, depending on how far you intend to go as you get stronger. It's probably one of the most common exercises you'll see people perform, and there's a reason why. It activates every fiber of your chest, shoulder, and triceps, putting the front side of your upper body to the ultimate test. If you perform this exercise twice a week, gradually increasing the weight load as you get stronger, you're going to build size in your chest and other upper body muscles eventually. I mean, it's inevitable. To perform the bench press correctly, you need to lay on your back on a bench grasping onto the barbell with both arms. Then you wanna lower the barbell to chest level, then press the barbell back upwards, extending your arms until your elbows are locked out. This counts as one repetition. Make sure the barbell is being brought all the way down to your chest each time, or your form is incorrect, and that can lead to injuries or ineffective bench presses. Something else to note is to maintain a slight arch in your upper back and push with power from your chest, as opposed to just using your arms. It's very easy for your body to move the weight load from your chest to other secondary muscles being used during compounds. In this case, you might end up using your triceps or front deltoids more, which you want to avoid. Mind-muscle connection is crucial for activating the chest muscles. There are several variations of the bench press to keep your chest workouts from getting stale and prevent your muscles from getting too comfortable. Some of them include the incline, decline, and hex press, amongst others. Switch and alternate training with as much of them as you like. I wouldn't go into the different variations in this video, but comment down below if you'd like to see a video on that. At number two, we have the deadlift. Deadlift refers to the lifting of dead weight, such as dumbbells lying on the ground or weight plates stacked on a barbell. Although this exercise uses the legs and hips as the primary movers, it can also be considered a back exercise. The barbell deadlift is a compound exercise that works the gluteus maximus with further work on the quadriceps femoris, hamstrings, trapezius, lats, and erector spinae. The quadriceps, hamstrings, adductor magnus, and soleus or calf muscles serve as synergists during the exercise. It's basically a powerhouse move that activates almost every muscle in your body. It requires a lot of power to complete, but the return is always worth the effort with this exercise. If you want to add mass or size to the muscles in your back, glutes and hamstrings, then this is surely the way to go. The preferred and most optimal way to perform deadlifts is with a barbell and weight plates. You can also perform the deadlift with dumbbells, but I find that doing it this way doesn't allow you to load massive weight loads, unlike with the barbell and plates. The deadlift uses a lot of energy and recruits the largest muscles in your body, so you should be aiming to push as much weight as possible with this exercise. It can also be less comfortable doing the deadlift with dumbbells, at least in my honest opinion. The conventional deadlift can be broken down into three major phases, the setup, the initial pull, and the lockout. For the setup phase, stand behind the bar with it touching or nearly touching your legs. While maintaining a flat feet, shift your weight to your heels and push your hips back behind while you hinge your hips forward. To get a better idea of how to do this, think about sticking your butt out behind you while maintaining only a slight bend in your knees. Maintain a long and straight back, taking care not to allow your knees to lean forward over your toes. Next, you want to grip the bar just outside of your legs. Lower your shoulders away from your ears to load your lat muscles and to generate force throughout your spinal 
erectors. During the next phase of the deadlift, a lot of force is produced to get through, which can be dangerous if performed incorrectly. By pushing down through your heels while simultaneously pushing up and forward with your hips as well as maintaining a depressed scapula and a long, tense spine throughout, you can remain safe during this motion. This is obviously the most difficult part of the entire movement due to the amount of work required to lift the bar off the ground initially. To complete the initial pull phase correctly, take a deep breath before you lift and hold it in during the movement, creating an outward pressure on the core. Keep the muscles of your back contracted tightly in order to maintain a safe posture throughout the motion and then drive or lift up and forward with your hips and legs to stand erect for phase three, the lockout phase. This is actually the most critical aspect of the entire movement, especially to avoid lower back injuries. This requires standing completely erect with a neutral spine and forceful hip extension to engage the muscles of the lumbar spine and the abdomen in unison with the glutes, which are all muscles in your midsection and lower body. To complete the lockout phase, push your hips completely into the bar. Contract or tighten your glutes and ab muscles to finish the movement with your pelvis in a neutral position. Contracting the glutes as well as the abdominal muscles is critical for lower back health and safety. If you loosen your glutes and or your ab muscles during the lockout stage, you risk putting pressure on your lower back from your upper body taking over the weight load. As for lowering the weight from the lockout position, just go through all three phases but in reverse order. Since the muscles of your back and core must remain tight throughout the motion, all you have to do is hinge at the hips and knees to bring the weight down. And remember to do that, just think of it as pushing your butt out backwards. Lowering your chest towards your knees while keeping the bar close is the safest way to complete this motion. Some common errors to avoid while deadlifting include protracting your shoulders, which disengages the back muscles that stabilize your spine. During protraction, the scapulae move away from the spine as you round the upper back. You basically protract by pushing your shoulders forward and spreading your scapulae across your back, trying to touch them in front of your chest. For the next area to avoid, you want to take off any slack from the bar right before you lift off by squeezing your back muscles first and straightening your arms. The bar should then be lifted in a smooth motion without any jerking. For the next error, since the goal of a deadlift is to hinge at your hips, the knees should not be bent so deeply that you're basically in a squatting position. Finally, make sure the bar is close to your feet. If the bar is too far from your body, you may end up compensating by rounding your back, which in turn leads to shifting which muscles are being recruited and could also cause injury. An excessively rounded back may result in the load being lifted awkwardly and placing too much stress or pressure on the back, which may ultimately lead to injury. The knees should be bent more fully on lowering the bar to preserve a neutral spine. There are several variations of the deadlift as well. Some common ones you can keep alternating between include the hex deadlift, the sumo deadlift, stiff-legged deadlift, amongst others. It's definitely great practice to keep switching between them to keep your muscles from getting adapted to just one. Finally, at number three, we have the squat. This exercise is great for building strength and size in your legs and your calves. It's a common strength exercise in which the trainee lowers their hips from a standing position and then stands back up to an erect position. While lowering the weight during the squats, the hip and knee joints flex while the ankle joints dorsiflexes, or in other words, bends towards your toes. While standing up, the hip and knee joints extend and the ankle joints plantar flexes instead, which is the opposite of dorsiflexing and basically your leg bending away from your toes. Squats are usually considered a vital exercise for increasing the strength and size of your lower body muscles, as well as developing your core strength. The main muscles being used and worked during the squat are the quadriceps femoris or the quads, the adductor magnus or inner thighs, and the gluteus maximus or the glutes. The squat also uses the erector spinae or spine as well as the abdominal muscles amongst others. The squat can be completed using a barbell and a rack or power cage or a Smith machine station, which is often better to use if you're more of a beginner to this exercise. It can also be completed with a set of heavyweight dumbbells to stimulate growth, but as always, the barbell gives you a better chance at loading massive weight loads that help stimulate your lower body muscles for insane growth. As for how to perform the squat correctly, the movement begins from a standing position. If you're working with dumbbells or kettlebells, you begin by holding both dumbbells in your hands along your sides, standing erect. When a barbell is used for the squat, 
Weight plates are added to the barbell from a standing position. You can either brace the bar across your upper traps muscles, and this is called a high bar squat, or you can hold the bar lower across your rear deltoids, and this one is called a low bar squat. The movement is started by moving your hips back and bending both your knees and hips to lower your torso and the respective weight, then return into the upright position. Squats can be performed to varying depths. The competition standard is for the top surface of your leg at the hip joint to fall below the top of your knee level, and this is commonly known as the parallel depth. Squatting below parallel qualifies a squat as deep, while squatting above it qualifies as shallow. Some authorities caution against deep squats, but I believe the relative safety of deep versus shallow squats is difficult to determine. I would personally try to go for more of an in-between or a deep squat. As the body descends, the hips and knees go through a bending motion. Muscles around the joints contract or tighten eccentrically, reaching maximal contraction at the bottom of the movements. The muscles around your hips provide the power you'll need to push the weight back up. If the knees slide forward or cave in, then tension is taken away from your hamstrings, hindering power on liftoff. Returning to an erect position tightens or contracts the muscles concentrically this time. Some common errors of squats to avoid include one, descending too quickly and flexing the torso too far forward. If you lower the weight too quickly, it can lead to an incomplete lift as well as injuries. Two, over flexing the torso greatly increases the forces exerted on your lower back, risking a spinal disc herniation injury, which causes lower back pain. Three, not aligning the knee with the direction of the toe. This can negatively place stress on the knee joint. Four, you want to avoid raising your heels off the floor, which reduces the contribution of the gluteus maximus. Just like the bench press and deadlift, there are lots of squat variations to pick from to keep your leg muscles from getting comfortable. Some other common variations include front, hack, overhead, and goblet, amongst others. Keep alternating and trying multiple variations to keep your leg muscles from adapting. So there you have it, guys. Three major compound exercises you need to be doing if you want to see significant progress in size and strength. There's a reason that these are the only lifts performed in the strength sport of powerlifting. And if you haven't noticed, powerlifters tend to have more mass than the average lifter. If you find that deadlifts or squats are too difficult to do or experience lower back pains when performing them, then you should definitely try the leg press instead, which doesn't use the lower back as often. It's a great alternative for squats and deadlifts. It all depends on your feet placement to either focus the leg press on your quad muscles or your hamstrings and glutes. Leave a comment down below if you have any questions at all. But that's all I've got for you guys in this video. I hope you have found it interesting and informative. If you did, do not forget to smash the like button and subscribe. Also hit the gold bell icon to be notified of new videos. It's Midas, and I'm out, y'all.